Well, welcome back to the channel. And welcome to what I suppose I would call a supplementary video to my series of videos about how to pass an advanced bike test. I have finished that series, it's in a playlist. I'll put a link below to the full playlist if you want to see it. But if you saw my last video in that series, you'll know that we conducted a genuine advanced bike test with username Kate and that Kate did very well on test she passed and I awarded her a first now both me and Kate got a lot of comments <coughs> on that video I think fortunately for Kate most of hers were extremely positive and actually most of the comments on my video were extremely positive a small percentage well they were pretty nasty really if I'm going to be honest bit uncalled for. I don't mind people asking questions but some of the allegations and things that were being thrown around in the comments section of that video I think we're uncalled for. Come on we're grown-ups we don't need to talk to each other like that do we even on the internet I'm pretty sure you wouldn't speak to me like that to be face but this isn't sour grapes what I've decided to do is take the questions out the comments section for that video and rather than answer them individually I thought I'd do a quick video talk about some of the issues some of the questions that people were raising because I viewed most of the uh, most of the comments were genuine questions about advanced bike test and misunderstandings little bits of confusion about things that th people think are rules and maybe aren't rules and things like that so I've noted down the main questions that came out of that video, I'm going to answer them uh, as best I can. I think one thing I want to make clear from the start in this video is we are not re-evaluating the candidate. That was never the purpose of putting these videos online, both mine and Kate's. The idea was to show you a genuine, honest, advanced bike test taking place under test conditions from both of our perspectives and I think that's what made it interesting and of course you know you're invited to make comments on YouTube I could have switched the comments off but I decided to leave them on I could have deleted some decided not to do that one thing I won't do is get in an argument with anybody over how that candidate has performed on test they've had the result there are lots of opinions out there you know what they say about opinions <laughs> there's only really one that counts on the day and that's the examiner and I absolutely stick by the decision that I made Kate gave a really good ride on the day I don't forget that video was edited down from about an hour and 15 minutes I think it was 37 minutes in total with the intro and the outro and stuff so there's a lot of stuff that wasn't included in there but let's clear up some of the uh, some of the questions that came up in the comments the first one and this was asked a few times was about how can you give somebody a first if they're scoring a two in one area? Well, let's break down the IEM scoring and I'll explain how it works. You are scored on 23 subjective elements, including system and observations and planning and rear observations and overtaking and progress and restraint and all this kind of stuff. And the examiner gives a mark for each of those 23 objective elements of the test. And that score will either be a 1, 2 or a 3. And if you get a 3, that means you're not yet up to the required standard. There's still some development required. And if you get a 3 in any of those 23 elements, then it's a fail. If you don't reach the standard in one area, you don't reach the standard across the board and that's pretty clear if you get a two in any of those areas a two means you have reached the required standard well done you've reached the standard that qualifies you to be an advanced rider and if you get a one well well done times two because if you get a one what that means is that you've exceeded the required standard and the minimum you need to get to pass the advanced bike test is a 2 in every area if you score a 2 in every area you are up to standard 
well done, you're going to pass the advanced bike test. Now a first is a recognition for that smaller number of riders who do particularly well on advanced bike test. And to get a first, you need to get mostly ones, mostly ones. But the IAM says that you are allowed up to three twos. As long as those twos are not scored in the areas of safety and legality, or application of the system of bike control. Do so you get ones across the board, but you get a two for safety and legality because you've been speeding a bit? Then well, you're not going to get a first. But you could potentially get a two for positioning. You could get a two for rear observations. Remember, a two means you've reached the required standard. You are good enough. You've passed. And you could get a two for use of the gears but if everything else is a one you're going to get a first so in the case of a candidate who gets one two a score of two for position and a score of one in all other areas that's absolutely a first somebody questioned the fact that I didn't tell the candidate immediately that they got a first well that's not how it works the instructions to examiners from the IAM are that at the conclusion of the test, the test is finished, you should give the candidate their result immediately. It's not like Simon Cowell where you leave them hanging on for an answer and build the drama up, that's not how we work. I'll tell you straight away whether you've passed or not. And a first, in case you didn't realise, is a pass. So what I do, and probably most of the examiners do, is tell people whether they've passed immediately, then go and sit down, go through the scores, top the scores up, have a think about it, and then make a decision whether it's a first or not. So that's how that works. Now another thing that seemed to come up an awful lot in the comments, related to which foot you should put down when you come to a stop. Now let me be clear about this, it does not matter what foot you put down when you come to a stop. What I am looking for as an examiner, from a candidate on test, is that they bring the bike to a nice controlled stop, and they keep the bike under control at all times, and that they set off nice and smoothly under control. Now what's happening here is people are mixing up technique with outcome, and it's the outcomes that I'm interested in on test. Does the bike come to a safe stop? Is the rider in control of it at all times and do they set off nice and safely? The technique that a lot of people use when they're coming to a stop is to just come to a stop on the back brake because it's a bit more gentle, it's a bit more controlled and you can hold the bike on the rear brake while you're stationary. But you don't have to do that. If you can come to a nice smooth controlled stop on the front brake, you want to put your right foot down or at traffic lights, it's perfectly acceptable. Don't forget as well that a lot of bikes these days have a hill hold function, this GS has it. Squeeze the brake. It's like a handbrake. It goes off automatically when you set off. So some people might be using that. But it doesn't matter as long as the bike remains under control. Could not care less which foot you put down at the traffic lights. I'd be really impressed if you put neither down, that'd be good. Nobody's done that yet. <laughs> so another thing that seemed to be discussed to death <coughs> on that video in the comments was hatch markings. And you know what, you know when you're answering somebody else's comments, especially when you've been a bit derogatory about the video and about the person who's posted it, make sure you know what you're talking about because otherwise you look a bit daft. Here's some hatch markings. Let's look at what the rule says about hatch markings. Hatch markings, according to the Highway Code, are placed on the road to separate lanes of traffic and to make it safer for right-turning vehicles. And the thing that matters more than anything with hatch markings is the line that borders them. The question you want to ask yourself is, is the line that borders those hatch markings broken or is it a solid line? Now, 
the hatch markings are bordered by a solid white line you must not enter them you treat them like double white lines they are effectively double white lines and when the highway code says you must not enter those hatch markings the border with a solid white line it means it's an offense if you do you're breaking the law you're not allowed to do it but the highway code says about hatch markings that are bordered with a broken white line it says you should not enter them not most should not enter them unless it is necessary to do so and it is safe to do so that might not be the exact words but it's something along those lines and then I read people saying well it's a grey area of the law people disagree on it there's nothing to disagree about it's not a grey area to be clear it is not an offence to enter hatch markings if they are surrounded by a broken white line the question of whether it's necessary to do so is a matter for you and you'd only have to ask that question if it all went really really wrong and there was an accident but there's still no offence you know, potentially you could commit an offence of careless driving by entering those hatch markings carelessly and causing an accident but the offence would be careless driving it wouldn't be entering the hatch markings bordered with this dotted white line or broken white line because there's no offence so hopefully that's cleared that up for you we've got to realise with hatch markings is that quite often they're at a junction and quite often they're an indicator that there's a junction or something there that might be hazardous to you as a driver or a rider and they are there to separate lines of traffic make it safer for right turning vehicles you've just got to be 100% sure that nobody's going to want to use that hatch marking for that purpose if you can eliminate that risk and it's necessary to use them to overtake a slow moving vehicle well that's fine and let's move from that to a similar subject that comes up in the comments a lot it's an automatic fail if you overtake near a junction no it's not because actually it's not the junction that's the issue the issue is the risks associated with that junction and those risks are a the vehicle that you're overtaking is going to turn into that junction and b a vehicle might emerge from that junction if you can eliminate that risk in your mind if you can absolutely be certain that that's not going to happen either from the position of the vehicles how close they are to the junction the speed they're traveling at well a junction isn't a bar to an overtake it's the risks associated with it so as an examiner yeah i'm looking for you as a candidate to weigh those risks up and make an appropriate decision but a junction the presence of a junction by itself is not an automatic fail actually linked into that it's very little that is an automatic fail on advanced bike testing this isn't the dsa it's not a fault based marking system it's a balanced marking system that looks at the whole ride and looks at whether you apply the principles consistently throughout the ride so let me address another fallacy that seems to have come up in the comments and that is to get a first you need to do a perfect ride absolutely not I'll tell you what i've not seen it yet i'm being totally honest i can't do the perfect ride i don't pretend to be the best rider in the world if i'm being honest but i've got some decent qualifications and i've been doing you know i've been doing this a while now i can ride a bit i know what's good and what isn't but there's no way i have ever given a perfect ride either on test or under instruction or on my own it's not possible we all make mistakes and actually i think people make more mistakes on test than they do when they're under observation when they're out with their observers because they feel under that additional pressure of test nobody really likes being put under that scrutiny some people are really badly affected by nerves and as an examiner I've got to take that into account I've got to take into account that people are affected by nerves so to be clear we we're not looking 
for little mistakes here and there to fail you on. I'm not mentally ticking a list in my mind every time you make a little mistake. I will see it, I'll notice it, and I'll store it in my memory bank and I'll revisit it. What I'm looking for is the mistakes that repeat themselves throughout the ride, the mistakes that don't correct themselves. If you continue to make a mistake throughout the ride, well that's a fault. And faults are the things that will fail you. If you fluff your system a couple of times during the ride, but the rest of the time everything's done in order, well, that's fine. I'll see the fluffs, but I'm looking for the consistency. If you momentarily overspeed in a restricted speed limit area, but then you correct it, and it doesn't happen again during the ride, well, you've done something about it, it's fine. It's a little mistake. You need to learn how to deal with mistakes. Don't, for example, convince yourself that you failed just because you've made a bit of a mistake. And one of the things I wanted to come across in that video was that as examiners we are fairly forgiving. We're not completely forgiving. You've got to reach the standard. We do forgive the odd fluff here and there, providing the rest of the ride is up to standard. Somebody said that having GPS on and activated on the test is not allowed. That's not true. The GPS is on and connected to your bike. In fact, actually, I've got my GPS on at the moment. Um, I've got a destination programmed in, Ribblehead Viaduct. And that's not because I don't know my way to the Ribblehead Viaduct, it's because having a scrolling map gives you nice advanced notice of what's coming up. So I can see from there that there is a right-hander coming up. There's the right-hander. That can be a help sometimes. If it's fitted to your bike, why not use it? Well, like I sometimes get asked about cruise control and whether you should use cruise control. Yeah, if you use it correctly and appropriately, why not? It's fitted to the bike. I use mine all the time, cruise control. Well, somebody asked, can you do the test on a 125 motorcycle? Well, yeah, you can. It's a motorcycle, it's not a moped. So you couldn't do it on a 50cc moped, but you could certainly do it on a 125cc motorcycle, as long as you've got a full licence. And finally, some of those suggestions that the test was a fiddle, I think were pretty insulting. Um, they were insulting to me, definitely insulting to Kate. Hand on heart, I don't see why I should have to do this actually, but hand on heart, the test was con conducted fully in accordance with all the IAM's rules and regulations. Somebody said, oh, you stopped to let her change your batteries in a GoPro. We can stop halfway around the test if we need to. I might see something on your bike flapping around that might be unsafe. I want to pull over and get that corrected. I had a candidate, female candidate, a couple of years ago who had a deer run out in front of her and uh, dealt with it really nicely, did an emergency stop, set off again and a couple of minutes later pulled over and said I just want to get my heart rate down a little bit because it scared me that and that candidate passed the test. There's nothing wrong with stopping if you need to, in fact it's something I do in the briefing at the start. Before we go out on the road I'll say to people you know you really feel like you need to stop for a reason then stop it's part of riding safely isn't it so yeah all right we stopped to change the batteries in the gopro one of the practicalities of making these videos is that you need to keep the batteries up to date and if we hadn't done that you wouldn't have got to see the whole video would you so there's some comments made about how my video was edited my video is edited to bring it down to a reasonable length the whole test is an hour and 10 minutes an hour and 15 minutes People don't watch that length of video on YouTube, so I cut mine down to the most salient points. Kate did her own edit, we didn't consult on what we should edit. The IEM were fully aware of what we are doing with that video, and have fully supported both me and Kate through the process, and I'm really grateful for that. 
But any suggestion that a candidate got preferential treatment because they're a YouTuber, nonsense. Well, Kate and I agreed, prior to that test, that whatever the result, we'd put it online. And that was pretty ballsy, to be honest, to go along and say, actually, you know what, if I fail this, I'm going to put it online, so every credit. In the end, however, she performed really well on test. She got a first. Of course, it wasn't the perfect ride, said before. There's no such thing. If you think I'm wrong about that, go out and make your own video. Put it online. Self up to scrutiny. But having said all that, most of the comments were really positive, so thank you very much for that. And if it's inspired you to go and have a go, you know, we really wanted to just take the mystery out of the test element and out of the whole IAM advanced bike course. I want to show you that it's achievable as well. We're definitely not looking for perfection. We're looking to improve your riding, make you safer, help you to enjoy your riding more. So, thanks for watching. Hope that's answered any questions that you might have. It's certainly I've tried to answer the bulk of the questions that cropped up. Those of you making more arsey comments, you know who you are. I'm not going to engage with you. So, you can carry on putting those comments on if you want, but you just get ignored. So, thanks a lot for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to go and have a look at the website, racelocal.com. Loads more stuff about advanced riding and driving. Information about the books that I've written. And how you can get a day's driver or rider coaching with me if you fancy a ride out. Maybe on a warmer day. My heated jacket on today. for now thanks very much for watching we'll see you next time